Oh, Americans, the best means of preserving our liberty is to cultivate the holy religion of Jesus, which is full of truth, justice, and mercy. Infuse its principles into the minds of the rising generation. Then our extensive empire may blossom like the rose, produce new heroic Washingtons and philosophic Jeffersons. Ages upon ages will unfold new splendors whilst bloody tyrants cause Europe to groan under oppression, with countries desolated, with fields smoking with human blood and gore, with cities wrapped in fire, and incessant woes filling the breasts of crying widows and orphans, a sight at which heaven bleeds and angels drop tears of sympathy. Vice debases a nation and is the introduction of all the concomitant miseries. Where are now the nations and empires of ancient renown? Where the Assyrian, the Macedonian, the Grecian, the Roman, once so celebrated among mankind, at whose voice the surrounding nations trembled? Alas, are they not precipitated from the clouds of heaven to the abyss of eternal shame and misery? where the ghosts of departed empires stalk about in sad lamentation of their former glory. Their desolation and ruin followed their departure from the path of duty, virtue, and honor. Who lads, you are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Zell and Heidi. Joining us today, the Reverend Adam Kuntz for more Tennessee Synod posting. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing outstanding. How are you? <laughs> doing well, doing well. How is the weather in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Well, it is the seat of empire, as we'll hear tonight from David Henkel. So, of course, the weather here is likewise <laughs> outstanding. Actually, it's it's warming up, and it was unseasonably cold. It felt like the Midwest for a day or two, and I was I was all dejection. But now it's warming up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after after that wonderful quote, I mean, it's it's hard not to be just uplifted in general. But there is still the weather out here, so <laughs> <laughs> the desolation of which Henkel was speaking was North Dakota. So. Was actually West of <laughs> yeah. yeah. true story. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's been cold and snowing again, so but that's nothing unusual. That's just another day in North Dakota. So here in Illinois it's fairly mild. The wind is attacking me as it does here out on this the original frontier. You know, that's all right though. You can probably hear it in my microphone some on this podcast, but <laughs> hey, that's what we do, you know. The original frontier, the actual frontier that's where I am. <laughs> What's the going rate for a beaver pelt these days? <laughs> I'd have to look it up, but it depends on what the fancies in Manhattan have in fashion. <laughs> Please, out east. The hat market out east is in shambles, so right. Z might not be able to make it through the winter, folks. Yeah. <laughs> one like equals one prayer. Remember Zelwyn. Hashtag pray for Z. <laughs> Well, if you're still with us after all that, <laughs> thank you. We're going to here. talk tonight. Yeah, thank you for listening to A Word Fitly Spoken, <laughs> where good preaching is the greatest drug. We've come here tonight, though, to talk about the Carolinian Herald of Liberty, a work of Reverend Hinkle. Reverend Hinkle comes from an interesting part of America. The words that he uses, his phrases, his rhetoric are all formed by the context in which he is reared and the context in which he lives and writes. So we're going to open with a discussion of the American climate at the time and the environment in which Hinkle lives. Why might that be important for understanding Hinkle's works? When we talked about the Tennessee Senate in a previous episode, we didn't so much cover the political geography of America that really affects why they are the way they are. And the Tennessee Synod setting entirely within Appalachia in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee proper, parts of South Carolina, is important because without that setting, it is hard to see that they have the precisely same perspective, especially on the question of power 
in the church, which is something that we will be discussing tonight. It's really the main burden of David Henkel's message in the Carolinian Herald of Liberty. And that perspective is conditioned, first of all, by the fact that Appalachia, which you could consider not only as a geographic phenomenon, but really as a cultural phenomenon tied to that geography, runs for our purposes tonight, really from the middle of Pennsylvania. Upstate New York is included sometimes too, but that's not really germane to our discussion. Yeah, it's more geographic that way than it is cultural. Yeah. Yeah, but the folks who found the Tennessee Synod, as we discussed in the previous episode on them, are descendants of people who settled sort of in the middle of Pennsylvania in what's called the Ridge and Valley region, and then spread from there southward down the Appalachian Mountains, which have a different name generally in every state in Pennsylvania. They're the the, the Alleghenies or the Laurel Highlands of different names in different places, but they spread down that geographic feature into the, the ridges and valleys there. What that did was it isolated them from the mainstream of American life, which either flowed up and down the seaboard proper, and this is what's a little difficult maybe for some listeners. These are all, quote, East Coast states, but they are very culturally and historically and politically separated from and self-consciously distant from the actual seaboard, which you might describe today as like the I-95 corridor. So they're, they're separated in that way, but they also maintain a way of life that is distinctive long after the frontier has moved far west of them. So there's, there's a relative isolation from the rest of America that's important to understand. You know, that's not really all that unusual. I know out in this part of the world, we do have cultural distinctions. I mean, they're probably not nearly as sharply defined as maybe they are in the eastern coast. But the idea that we're not just one giant homogenous mass in America is something that I think is self-evident. Right. So, Right. It's more of a mixed salad than it is a melting pot. And it was that way up until mass media. The local pockets get preserved. I mean, if you go look at the Appalachians... Really, you had it going on up until the 50s and really the 60s when a when a bigger expanse started going out. Media became bigger. People started moving away, working away. And so culture became more homogenized because of certain plots and plans and things like that. And it's almost foreign to us now. You know, we can open up and access regions and, and learn things about them, you know, even, you know, through visual means even. So it's it's almost a foreign concept anymore to think about just how different the English was of the Appalachian settlers and how long that persisted, the food, the folk traditions, the folk magic even that we talk about in the Joseph Smith episode of all things. That isolation serves, you know, really to define the people of the Appalachians in a way that really calcifies and it's not really like anything that we see in other parts. I mean, maybe scattered here in the Ozarks or something. Sure. And I'm not trying to describe Appalachian Americans as like cavemen or anything like that. It's just basically the Scots-Irish land, and they, they stay Scots-Irish, you know, until until cable TV. I think in its own historical context, you're talking the 1820s, 1830s, Henkel's writings play into a great fear that America is captive to sort of the same class that would now be described as the deep state or financial powers, financiers, big business, the military industrial complex. Those people are in Henkel's time on the Eastern seaboard and they are merchants and, and in the South planters. And there is a sense that what is going on with the rest of the church is that the rest of the church wants to yoke itself to that power and by so doing become more influential and powerful in ways that the gospel does not ordain for the church to be powerful. So All that amalgamation and capital. There's a, a mutually reinforcing suspicion of political power and religious power that is important to understand, especially from the vantage point of people who feel constantly marginal. No one knows and no one cares about them. And that would be okay if they were left alone, but they are indeed not left alone and therefore this protest. Right. So then 
what is going to prompt the writing of the Carolinian Herald of Liberty then? Yeah. Yeah. The immediate issue is the refusal of the Senate of North Carolina to ordain David Henkel as a pastor, promoting him from deacon. That precipitates the formation in 1820 of the Tennessee Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Tennessee Synod. Now, why is he refused ordination? He was refused ordination because of actual confessional differences, differing understandings of what it meant to be a Lutheran. As we talked about in the previous Tennessee Synod episode, the folks who refused to ordain Henkel, led by a man named Gottlieb Schober, who was not even a member of the Lutheran Church, but served as a minister, understood Lutheran to mean something akin to German Reformed or generically Christian. It was not tied to the Lutheran confessions. And the folks who formed the Tennessee Synod, chief among them the family of Paul Henkel, of whom David is the most illustrious son, understand Lutheran to mean someone who confesses the doctrine and, and practices the practice of the Augsburg Confession and the other documents in the Book of Concord that exposit its doctrine in greater fullness. And just to be clear, the Tennessee Synod will require subscription to the entire Book of Concord. That is, yeah, that is correct. And they are, they are for that reason, the first... Unique, right? Yeah, well, they are, yeah. At that time, they are... And then with the formation of the Missouri Synod, they remain unique because they are a vastly predominantly English-speaking Lutheran church that requires strict confessional subscription. Right. And they're, and because of their audience, they are going, their work looks very different from Missouri Synod early missions. Yeah, it does because they are using the common language of America and translating the Book of Concord in its entirety into English in 1851 and then in a really good revision in 1854. So their their context for mission as also their political context and their relationship to America is very different from the Midwestern immigrant bodies. I would point out also in connection with the background of this document that Schober, for example, had been involved with a number of kind of very shady political moves, at least according to David yeah. Henkel, yeah. basically trying to finagle the North Carolina Synod into joining into what would eventually become the, the General Synod. Yeah, that's the, the General Synod of the Lutheran Church. Yeah, and that's and that is the goal. And that is tied to a lot of other plans that I know we're going to talk about later in the podcast. But there's a, there, if you will, there's a conglomeration of theological and ecclesiastical issues surrounding the formation of the Tennessee Synod, which David Henkel sees. And I think this is kind of a, this is a very valuable perspective that when something is going wrong in the church, it is basically never a matter of sort of one part not working, right? You know, your your dryer doesn't work and you take some of it apart and you figure out that, you, you know, this bushing is worn out or you need this part or whatever, right? It's 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 a matter of... Fi- Adam does not do a lot of dryer, re- dryer it's, repair. It's fixing. <laughs> well, there are, yeah, there are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> only once. As if there's like a system and there's just kind of one thing wrong. But because the church is a body... When things go wrong, it's more similar to a human illness where it affects your mind, your spirits, maybe other parts of your body. Cancer can spread from... It's often systemic. Yeah, that's saying, right. right. And so there are an array of issues surrounding his and others' effective expulsion from the North Carolina Synod that are all connected. So let me ask you this that regarding the North Carolina Synod. Is it a case of like the domino effect where one error has led to another and things have compounded or is the root rotten? Is there something in the foundation from the very beginning that's really to blame for all of this? Yeah, I think Henkel would say that there is a basic problem which organically has spread throughout the body. And the basic problem is the desire for power. And a lot of the peculiarities about the Tennessee Synod that we either discussed in the first episode or will discuss tonight, things in which they are kind of unique, even still down to this day, their polity, their refusal to incorporate anything, those things exist because of their experience with power 
and power grabs and the exercise of power in the church that precipitated the document under discussion. This is not something that's going to be unique for the North Carolina Synod, right? This is going to be a perennial problem that you're going to see in a lot of church governance and incorporated entities and that kind of thing. Right. Do you think as we go as we go through this discussion, is this going to be merely just for historical trivia? Or do you think that these are issues that the Carolinian Herald of Liberty speaks to today? Yeah, I don't I mean I personally would not be sitting here recording this if if I thought that it was just of historical interest, because then it would have already passed and we could safely, you know, buttonhole Henkel's concerns as just the ravings of a particularly intense <laughs> Jeffersonian who had let his political philosophy run all the way through his theology. <laughs> what Henkel identifies is what he describes as the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist being a figure in scripture who, in both senses of, of anti in, in Greek, both stands opposite Christ and stands or desires to stand in the place of Christ. And so that spirit, Henkel connects to the desire for power. Now, we'll discuss how that's operating on a bunch of different levels, both politically and or ecclesiastically. But the basic desire for power, the desire to be something and to grasp at something is a fundamentally anti-Christ move. And he understands the General Synod nationally, but also the North Carolina Synod locally to be seeking power above all things, which he understands as contrary to the gospel when the church behaves that way. Now, when we say power, is it just power for the sake of having authority, or is this power with the intent of, say, worldly acclaim or esteem, or is it a power with monetary motives? It's really hard to separate those things in practice because, for one, from the one who wants power from his perspective— it generally appears benevolent. I think that anyone who has ever wanted anything can understand how easy self-justification is for a generally good person in the pursuit of something which is objectively evil, but which he believes he will use or, 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 or does use for the good. Or only he That's can right. use. Hankel on several occasions in the Herald of Liberty actually says, you know, I know that my opponents like in Philadelphia or something probably don't actually think this way, but power is invariably going to corrupt it into this eventually. Right. So he sees it as, yes, it starts out for the best, for the best intentions, but it's in invariably going to end up to be exercising power simply for the sake of power. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, the spirit of Antichrist is much stronger than the man who has given himself over to it. And the man does not know that going into it. To, to Willie's question about what kind of power are they looking for, it's a whole grab bag because potentially with the formation of first a national Lutheran church body and then thereafter, and this was in Samuel Schmucker's plan in forming the General Synod and having a seminary, was a formation of a national Protestant church body which could potentially be either functionally or even constitutionally, the national church for the United States of America, which was much easier to imagine prior to massive Catholic immigration. I mean, in the 1820s, America is a vastly Protestant country. So if you can, if you can unite all of those churches together, you can really get something big going. Well, hold that thought. We're going to talk more about power in the church on the other side of the break. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Hang tight. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly.
And we're back. You're listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grill, Zoe and Heidi, Adam Kuntz talking Tennessee Synod, Dave Hinkle, and the Carolinian Herald of Liberty. On the other side of the break, we were talking about sinfulness associated with lust for power and what happens to men often when they are faced with that temptation. So let's step back a bit, put it into the context of the Tennessee, or excuse me, the North Carolina Synod, and see what was going on, Adam. I'm going to warn you that if you pick up the Carolinian Herald of Liberty, I think you can get it free on the internet, or you can get it in the collected volume of David Henkel's writings. If you do that, some of it is going to be boring, because it is someone else's detailed examination of how people messed with him and other people who agreed with him. And you know, if you've ever tried to relate a personal problem, especially a bureaucratic problem or an internecine familial problem to somebody else, it's not the most riveting material. So if you pick this up, you're going to get a lot of details. So just to shorten it, the basic issue is the underlying theological divide, confessional divide in the North Carolina Synod. But theology is expressed in the church through how the church treats one another. And what happens in the case of the Henkels, and especially of David as kind of the point man, the young buck, he's on fire, and he's a major spokesman for a more rigorous Lutheranism in the North Carolina Synod. When his promotion essentially comes up for debate, what the other faction within the North Carolina Synod does is they surreptitiously change the meeting time for the annual meeting of the Synod. They move it. They don't really notify people. And they hold the meeting and call it a regular meeting. And they do that in order to have somebody to send up north to go to a formation meeting for the General Synod of the Lutheran Church in the United States. And they don't, they don't really tell the Henkels. So the Henkels and their, their pals, their confidants, show up at the normal time, and no one's there. And the church is locked. And they send to the pastor, and the pastor says, well, you're not getting in because it's not the time for the meeting. Didn't you know that? Now, after a while, they're allowed into the church to have a preaching service, but they're not allowed to stay there for business. So they go outside and they withdraw from the North Carolina Synod and form the Evangelical Lutheran Tennessee Synod under a tree in the churchyard. Those are the basic precipitating events, both the refusal to promote David Henkel and also the changing of the meeting time. But what I want the listeners to understand is how the desire for power manifests itself both on these really small levels and on some bigger ones that we'll, that we'll talk about. I mean, I mean, it, it seems, you know, it's, I feel stupid relating it, you know? Yeah. It sounds inconsequential, right? Or, I mean, it sounds right. like it should be inconsequential. Yes, like, well, exactly. it was a mix up. Exactly. What it appears happened, at least according to Hinkle, is that this was all deliberate yeah, in, order yeah. to, in order to shut them out. If You can read it one way and it sounds like it's just simply a guy getting his panties in a wad, but it, it's actually a clear political move to ostracize this young preacher with fire in his belly right. and this and this guy who is doing everything he can to uphold a firm and steadfast confession in the doctrines of the Lutheran church. So you have just this one faction who do not want to see that kind of Lutheranism officially adopted, right? So they're right. doing everything they can to keep him out. And it's pretty simple. I mean, he's not a pastor, so they can keep him this in this other office as deacon, which is going to, you know, keep him down on the ladder a bit. And then they're literally locking them out of meetings when they're not changing meetings. Right. So it's a clear motivated political move. When you just, you know, when we just go A, B, C, and D, it's like, well, okay, maybe they overreacted, but, it, but it's more, it's more than that. And, and you wonder, you know, what, what would go through the mind there, especially of an Appalachian when they're slighted in such a way. These are Southern Appalachian men. I imagine a duel had to cross their minds at some point, but, you know, it is <laughs> yeah, what it is. There's no report of guns coming out, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So. <laughs> he wore his big coat that day and, you know. I, I couldn't help but notice that you introduced the section referring to him as Dave Hankel, as if you already have a kinship with him. So, <laughs> so I understand, Willie. 
I approach every subject neutrally, as you know. (laughs) (laughs) There is no such thing as neutrality in the Christian church, listeners. Anyway, so we come here. So that's, that's what's going to happen. Now, what develops from this? Then they 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 immediately go out, stand under a tree, and found a senate. Right. It, it's it's just that easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, they they don't believe in incorporation, so there's literally no paperwork that needs to be Correct. put down. Yeah. They 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 will have documents, but you know, <laughs> it's literally just going out and shaking on it. There's something pure about that. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to use another neutral word, I mean, I, I, I think, I think before we talk about the distinctives of the Tennessee Synod, which really are going to be because of this analysis of power, we should talk about what does happen and and how Henkel was right about the designs of his opponents. Yeah, that's what I mean. What comes from them rejecting Henkel's counsel? Right. They are able to join the the nascent General Synod, and the General Synod is overseen by Samuel Simon Schmucker, who becomes the president of the Gettysburg Seminary and does a lot of other things with his life. I mean, very a very accomplished man from a certain perspective. A, a notable character. A notable character. That's, that's about, yeah, what you can say. <laughs> and Schmucker... Schmucker is an unusual man in several respects, but certainly he agrees with the North Carolina Senate in his confessional perspective, which is that Lutheranism is not an eschatological confession. The utter truth of doctrines confessed on the basis of scripture, which must be maintained at the peril of losing one's faith. Lutheranism is more of a base to operate from but not the limit of his operation and certainly not the entirety of the Christian truth. So from that perspective, Schmucker desires and will be the chief mover in a plan that will really find its greatest purchase actually after the Civil War. So that's 40 years, 45 years into the future. But he will form the Evangelical Alliance, which is a kind of pre-20th century try at a national council of churches, a group of ecumenically operative bodies, which could eventually, according to a plan which Schmucker actually writes out in detail, could form eventually a single national Protestant church body. So in Schmucker's plan for union, he lays all that out. Now, that is that is important because a single national church body means the death of Lutheranism because it's not a confessional church body. And Lutheranism is not just an ethnic flavor or something. It's a confession. And therefore it, it, it has to exist either exclusively or it goes out of existence. Lutheranism cannot, it, it, it cannot exist in a church body where other theologies are tolerated. You see that tone throughout the Lutheran confessions and it's the tone that the Tennessee Synod also takes. You either go with confessional Lutheranism or you go with something else entirely. You cannot amalgamate it with anything else, but that's what the General Synod will try to do. Now, there are other designs that Schmucker himself may have had. Uh, Some of those, Henkel in his vituperative way, I think rightly, rightly suspects, including designs on national political power, and the financial power that would accrue to a central church body. And that central church body would be run, certainly in the early 19th century, out of the the heart of Lutheranism in colonial America, which is Pennsylvania. I know that Zelwyn has a nice quote from Dave, pains from me to Dave. say that, from Dave, <laughs> ready to go about my own, my own beloved Commonwealth. And this is, this is Henkel's suspicion about Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'll just read the quote and then I'll comment on it. Henkel says, Is it for Pennsylvania to sway her regal scepter over her sister states with her major representation? Is she alone the temple of the Lord? Yes. And, and of course, what Henkel mean, is talking about that is is also this idea that even if it's for the idea of joining together Lutherans, like if we're just talking about the general um, synod, yeah, invariably it's going to become of 
one the greater power having more sway over all of the lesser ones the bigger synods having sway over the smaller synods and invariably forcing them to go their way one way or another correct so that's kind of what he's getting at yeah but it's a great quote i mean and the and the plain answer is yes i know that's not what he intends but the plain answer is yes it is it does belong to to sway (laughs) to sway her regal scepter over over all the land just just because you built the railroads, that doesn't give you anything. Come on. We we only <laughs> ever got one president and he is almost uni- universally defamed, so we're still <laughs> we're still waiting for our deserved place in the sun. <laughs> but I, I think that I think that it's important to note that this is an issue that comes up in other church bodies. There was a plan for the synodical conference near the end of the nineteenth century to amalgamate as a single national church body. And part of the reason that that never happened, either then or in the early 20th century, was because the Wisconsin Synod was very concerned that it would lose not only its seminary, but also its identity, its existence, if it were amalgamated with the much larger Missouri Synod. So this is an issue that comes up a lot, even when the issue of confession is settled. So I have talked about the Lutheran confessions quite a bit tonight. But I want to point out that the issue of power can exist even where there isn't some kind of explicit on paper theological difference. Yeah, I, th- I think you bringing up the synodical conference is an excellent point, because even though if you read how the breakup happens, which we will talk about in an eventual episode, there are still some theological differences. But even in between two church bodies that are ultimately in agreement with each other on a, a large number of things, it is that exercise of power can become quite tempting because, you know, Missouri was saying, well, why don't we just join together? Why do we need to be so spread out? Why do we need to be divided when we say the same thing? Right. But but Wisconsin ultimately comes around and says, no, we, we don't want to be subsumed. We don't want to get lost. Well, anytime you hear those bigger entities saying that, you all you always think of Hansel and Gretel. It's like the big guy's got a gingerbread house that he wants you to come in. That's what it always <laughs> sounds like if you're suspicious. And, that, is, you know. that is the most German thing you've ever said. Okay. And probably ever will say. It's true. Yeah, it's, it's, true. it's also a perfect example of the spirit of Appalachia. I'm just pointing that out. Too. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Eternal yeah. suspicion yeah, of eternal authority. Suspicion. Right. That's all right, though, folks. Keeps us safe. Keeps us warm. So, so the question has to be asked then, Adam, if someone is trying to exercise power, let's say for what seem to be good intentions, how should we interpret that in the church? I mean, how do we deal with that kind of trying to gain power, even for possibly good positive reasons? Yeah. Can good intentions be corrupted? I think that there's, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I think one of them is the question of scale, which is something that Henkel brings up frequently. One of his points is that the Augsburg Confession, Article 7, requires for the unity of the church agreement in doctrine and practice on the basis of that doctrine. It does not require a certain amount of amalgamation. So he asks, I think it's, you know, I think it's rhetorical, but there is there is some kind of substance behind it. Why do we need to join when we are already joined? What is it that you are trying to do that we can't do already, already agreed in doctrine, already agreed in practice? Now, he's, he's being very charitable when he says that, because that's, that's not really the case, certainly not with all of the Pennsylvania Lutherans, but that's okay. Just set that to the side. He says, we already agree. What do you need from us that we all have to go to all these meetings and we have to form these things and send our money and our boys somewhere else. Why do we have to do that? What's that all for? And there's suspicion behind that, but there's also the theological point of what are you looking for? Well, and just a point of order, sending our boys off refers to sending them to their seminaries. Yes, sir. Not to a war. That's right. Yeah. Right. (laughs) That comes later. But the principle still stands. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also with that, too, was the idea that the general synod would be where pastors would be ordained. And you could only be ordained when you received your your licensing through this general synod. And he said, well, that invariably makes our preaching of the gospel dependent upon a human organization rather than upon Christ himself. 
to put it in kind of modern terms, he's he's intensely localist. He sees the gospel as being capable of taking on substance in a ch- in the church locally, and therefore you have what you need. Now, I would differentiate this from he's not really a congregationalist when he talks about polity. So locally does mean a synodical organization which meets pastors and lay delegates, in their case, every single year. But it's local in the sense that it's people who can easily reach one another and, and can have converse with one another. Yeah, so a synod is more akin to a diocese in their conception. That's right, yeah. Or or maybe in Missouri terms, uh, just having districts and no synod kind of a thing. Yeah, and it's tricky. It's tricky with that, but, though, because our districts are conceived as the synod rachur, you know, so the synod in place. But these right. are going to function a bit more independently. Is that the idea? Yeah. So you have you have a, a much more localized synod, so that maybe the size of what we would consider to be a district, as opposed to you know the nationwide sort of a thing. And a very small district. I mean, the Tennessee synod at its biggest is about the size of the New Jersey district. Yeah, they never have more than 40 pastors. Is that correct? At their height? Yeah, that's right. The New Jersey district, that's an odd measuring stick. It's like That's like rods to the hog's head, you know? It's, How does... it's a, well, sure. It's, it's, a, it's a small geographical area. And I mean, the New Jersey district has more active pastors than that, than 40. So, yeah, but, yeah. but it's, it's reachable. It's all sort of one context. They all know each other. The other thing with a seminary is that a seminary takes out of the hands of local pastors the examination and ordination of candidates. And that gets mm. that gets outsourced. And he doesn't see a reason for that either. He's like, we're doing it. Like, it's fine. Like, what do we need to what do we need to change it for? So there's there's a lot of concerns. I think probably in the next segment we'll be able to get into more of what he means by Antichrist and, and how they how they try to organize against the spirit of Antichrist in their own synod. But I, I think for now, we can say that one of the biggest concerns that he has is that whereas in the church, there should be plain speaking, it should be possible to say your mind and, and to deal with people saying their mind. He sees that the spirit of power makes it impossible for brothers to relate to one another as brothers with frankness. And that that is one of the effects of the the search for power that he experienced in the North Carolina Synod. He grew up in this thing. His dad was one of the men that got it off the ground. Why have things changed? Well, one reason things have changed is because if something stands in the way of getting power, but it's too awkward to talk about it, what you will do is just not talk about it. So you lose a kind of honesty within yourself and a wholesome frankness in relating to your brother because because you need you need the power more than the truth. Yeah, and it's usually masked as the preservation of the institution, right? Right. Because yeah. that's the threat there. So if we say this one thing, it's going to cause a disruption and we don't want any disruption. Right. So we can't always be frank and honest. We have to use some kind of double speak, some nicety, or complete, completely and totally ignore it. Right. Because any hint of instability is a threat then to the organization. And we don't want that. Right. So they, I mean, they, they can't let David Henkel become a full fledged pastor because if he did, he'd be able to stand up and say his mind about things and someone might actually listen to him. So the thing that you do is you just kind of like mess with them and, and just you just don't let him get to the point where he's able to say his mind rather than dealing with the fact that he thinks something different. So there's there's an underhandedness that always comes with power simply because there's no other way to get things done efficiently while maintaining your power and your institutional control. But like locking the doors and changing meetings is the most store brand version of Machiavellianism I've ever <laughs> heard of. <laughs> Well, I mean, treat, it's, you know, it's, treat lunch meat of of politics, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just antebellum North Carolina. It's not Renaissance Italy, so they do what they can. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna take another break. We'll be right back with more word fitly.
Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. The mission of Word Fitly Spoken is to put the Word of God at the center of all of life. To find out more, check us out at wordfitlyspoken.org. Welcome back to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Zelwyn Adam talking about the Carolinian Herald of Liberty. It's been a very interesting discussion, the formation of the Tennessee Senate and what precipitated that. It's interesting some of their peculiarities that they have. What I find particularly interesting is that they don't incorporate. Now, that's just, it's like every respectable church is incorporated, kind of like every respectable church has a mortgage these days. So that's something that is really strange to us. Why wouldn't they want to incorporate? Yeah, again, this seems mundane, but it's sort of like people's media viewing habits. It it tells you a lot about the person, no matter how mundane it might look. <laughs> Those Netflix algorithms are betraying you, fam. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And they won't incorporate because they do not believe it is right for churches to hold property. They believe in a very strict difference between the operation of the state and the operation of the church. And they do not want the church to in any degree be answerable to the state. I'm strangely warm right now. (laughs) (laughs) So they they just kind of stay. It's like somebody... I, I have heard of people, I, I met people at my Quaker college, which shall remain nameless, <laughs> that they would not make enough to be taxed so that they would not have to pay into anything connected to the right. Department of Defense, right? Because they were so pacifistic. So the Tennessee Senate does something similar with avoiding incorporation, which means according to the state, it, it is as if they do not exist. And therefore, they cannot be messed with by the state at all. So who's holding the property then? Do we know? It seems that it was sort of prominent prominent laymen for any given congregation. So, so they'll have a space somewhere on their property for like a, as a meeting house. So, so they're still going to be paying property taxes, everything, but nothing is registered. Correct. And that is not unprecedented. The Tennessee Senate does do something which also happens here in Pennsylvania, where the oldest churches are usually, you know, they'll have a religious name like St. John's or whatever, but then what people call them and what may actually be on the sign is is somebody's last name. You know, this is Brown's Church or this is Sadison's right. Church, because those are the people who were the caretakers or owned the property or something. So it seems like that's just the system they run with in the Tennessee Senate as well. Yeah, it's interesting. And these are still in the days where we believe what the Bible said about usury, for example. You know, so it probably <laughs> wasn't <laughs> what? <laughs> probably, yeah. probably wasn't quite as foreign, you know, as it as it sounds to our ears. Right. To avoid to avoid banks altogether is within the living memory of certain Appalachians. So it's not that unusual in its own place. Yeah, I do think that my yeah, paternal family fortune is buried under a parking lot right now well, because of that, go. you know. There it is. Got to get a pickaxe and some vacation time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they that that's one of their peculiarities. Most of their peculiarities are in their polity. They're not in their confession. That's pretty straightforward. And that's actually, it's ironic if you read Friedrich Bente, who is a early 20th century Missouri Synod theology professor. He writes in his volumes on American Lutheranism about the Tennessee Synod at some length. You can tell that he's an admirer. However, what's interesting is that he focuses almost entirely on their theology. And that's fine. And they are somewhat unique in that, at least until the Synodical Conference comes along. But what they're actually really interested in is the connection between liberty in the church and liberty in the state and how a church, which is diligent in preserving its own liberty, will likewise be diligent about preserving liberty in the state, whereas a church, which is diligent in pursuing power, 
will also be diligent in enforcing power within the state. So there's a connection here between opposite ways of life, a way of liberty and a way of tyranny. And, and they see tyranny all over the church in the United States. What would be some other examples other than the incorporation? One of them is their devotion to the idea of the the voluntary giving to pastors and the non-centralization of administering things. They don't have a common pool of funds. So in some ways, their work and even their region of work resembles a Methodist circuit rider, but they are vastly less organized than the Methodists. Some of that is to their misfortune. There are constant discussions in the annual synod reports about exhorting the brethren to be more generous in their giving to the work of the gospel and and so forth. You can tell they don't have any money. And a lot of the pastors are taking lots of other jobs in order to support themselves, and they regret the neglect that they show, therefore, to the work of the gospel in order to feed their families. They definitely had money problems. There is no centralization except for the annual synod. Hmm. So as we as we talked about a little bit in the in the earlier episode, pastoral training is in an apprenticeship program, and that's probably the most centralized thing that they do because men are accepted for training and then promotion to deacon, which means they can preach and baptize and catechize on their own. And then promotion to pastor, which means the full exercise of ministerial functions. Is the examination of ministerial candidates happening at the congregational level or at the synodical level? It happens at the synodical level, and it's done only by the pastors. And it it, it seems to be several hours, at least, a long thing relative to theological examinations in the present day. That's really the most centralized thing they do, is the training of pastors. But even that is, so to speak, outsourced on a day-to-day level to the candidate and to a mentor, somewhat similar to a vicarage supervisor today. They don't do a central institution. They don't hold property. They don't have a common fund. They don't even really have a common treasury for hardly anything. You mentioned earlier that uh, Hankel brought up the Augsburg Article 7 as kind of their justification for all of this, that unity in the gospel consists only in, you know, preaching the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It's fairly remarkable how consistent they are in following that principle through all the way uh, through all of their different manifestations, you know, this non-incorporation, this, you know, decentralization, all of it. If we're going to agree in the gospel and find our unity in Christ and in Christ alone, all of this other stuff almost doesn't matter. I mean, is that kind of, is that fair? Yeah, and it, it's a little hard to hear that the right way because sure. for instance, things that things that contemporary Lutherans fight over, like worship styles, right? Which is right. effectively decided on a congregation by congregation basis in the LCMS or or really any Lutheran church today in in the United States. You know, the Tennessee Synod produces a liturgy which everyone is expected to use. They sure. they they just don't the, the distinction they're making is not it's not really congregationalism versus any form of organization whatsoever. The distinction they're making is like you said, what if we actually organized a church on the basis of what we understand the Bible and the confessions to be outlining? One thing that is, I think, really unique about them is peculiar to them is not just these different little institutions, the lack of a common treasury, the refusal to incorporate, not developing a seminary. It's also that they think of polity as not a wax nose. You can't just organize however you want. So they believe that that Acts and the Scriptures actually inform us and yeah. prescribe, rather, not just inform, but actually prescribe a polity. Yeah, they they they're they're not as stringent about that as maybe a Baptist is about congregationalism or something, but they do believe that the Scriptures and, as Elwin reminded us, the Confessions outline a way of functioning which is for the sake of the gospel meaning that other ways of functioning would be contrary to the gospel and that those other ways of functioning can be summed up under the term of the spirit of antichrist. 
Well, let's unpack that term. Nothing yeah. loaded there. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> nothing. And, and I think it's important for listeners to understand, I mentioned it just a little bit, how when this is written, there are, relative to the whole population, almost no Roman Catholics in the United States. The term popery is not just a, quote, term of abuse. Popery is a charge that you throw out to say that someone is despotic, irrational, destructive, anti-Christian. That's what you use that term for. Yeah. And the, I mean, look, the papal states are still in play at this time. There's, right. This is well before unified Italy, well, right? Well, Pius IX is going to go to war in 25 years. <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. Yeah, there are still papal troops. I think this is a great quote because it kind of uh, gets to the heart of what he's getting at with that idea of popery. Uh, he's talking about another thing the General Synod is trying to do, and he says, The whore of Rome rides upon seven mountains, and the beast has seven heads. And what a fair opportunity is offered by this article, which the General Synod was proposing, to introduce the mystic seven of iniquity into the Lutheran Church. Who can deny but that many grades in the ministry is one of the peculiar life strings of popery and one of the lineaments of its image. And all that is wanting is the breath of life to be blown into its nostrils for it to become a living beast, which may gore all the other beasts of the field. <laughs> Gentlemen, if we don't use Bill the Butcher as the featured image for this episode, we're doing a disservice <laughs> to the audience. You know? So, I, and I, I want to I want to point out something really important because in a lot of churches, through churches, you're gonna you're gonna hear that something is Catholic or too Catholic, or we should be more Catholic or whatever. He's not identifying Roman Catholicism with a certain amount of ceremony or something like that. Mm -hmm. he's identifying Roman Catholicism with, with a certain exercise of power in the church, which I think is a very valid historical insight that the Reformation from Rome's perspective is not about justification by faith. It's about maintaining or losing power within the Holy Roman Empire, over the monasteries, over the orders. It's about power. And Henkel says, therefore, that just because... Just because Gottlieb Schober or Samuel Schmucker doesn't even, I mean, Schmucker wasn't even vesting, right? He's, he's really bought into American Protestantism. Just because you're doing that, just because you wear a coat and tie instead of vestments, doesn't mean that you're not severely infected by what Henkel calls popery. Popery is the desire to rule over the church, to lord it over the church, to have your way and have your say so that when he's talking about grades of ministry, you can think, oh, well, there's, you know, historically, there's the three major orders and the four minor orders. And that was used to maintain control over people and charge people money at each stage of advancement. When he's saying grades of ministry, he's saying, well, the seminary president is going to be a lot more important than a regular old seminary professor, but a seminary professor is going to be a lot more important than a regular old pastor. And certainly somebody who's just training and wandering around teaching the gospel, he's not important at all. And you know who's going to be more important than anyone else is going to be the guy in charge of the whole general synod. So the grades in the ministry thing he sees as a potential within the Lutheran church. Not that the Lutherans would recapitulate literally everything that happened in medieval Roman Catholicism, but that they would recapitulate the desire for power and they would make the same basic moves. And in making those moves, they would incarnate the spirit of Antichrist. Which brooks no opposition, and like you said, will gore every other beast in the field. When you grab hold of that kind of power, you're not going to say, oh, and this has just become something indifferent. It's going to be, right. my will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Right, yeah, exactly. It literally means my will. And these guys, you know, not the will of the Lord, that's different. And the men who rise up in these positions often have the best of intentions. I've no doubt that many a Pope of Rome has had the best of intention, and nevertheless, he became a despot, an antichrist, and a child of hell. We ought to be mindful of that ourselves. I mean, it can happen at any level of power that anyone's given, but it's all the more severe, the more authority, and the more people that you have under you. That's a great temptation. Any man who has power thrust upon them ought to pray to Almighty God that he stay humble that the Holy Spirit works and guides him. He ought to be diligent in the means of grace. He ought to be diligent in the scriptures. He ought to be diligent in prayer and discipline because that is part and parcel of original sin. Man fell 
through sinful ambition, that grasping at what isn't ours. And so we ought to take a step back then and recognize this principle that runs throughout all of human history and, and see just how great the temptation is there. And Hegel's, I mean, he's wise here, and he's quite prescient because he, we see this unfold in denomination after denomination. Yeah, and he he is very clear that his opposition is because Christ has already ordained for his church the gospel and the sacraments. And because those are not human inventions, they're not cooked up by us, they are not subject to power. That the minister who is proclaiming the gospel and administering the sacraments in accordance with the institution of Christ is not someone who is doing it for his own sake. So to speak positively for a second, rather than just to continue Henkel's critique of power, which is which is itself very powerful. But to speak positively, if you're thinking about this going forward, whatever kind of position of authority you may be in, the thing to think about is how you may imitate Christ in using that authority for the benefit of the person over whom you have authority. And that what is happening in the church in the preaching of the gospel is that the preacher is not preaching for his own benefit such that a church organized around the means of grace rather than around a variety of human institutions will be much more robustly set up against the spirit of Antichrist because it is already committed to the spirit of Jesus who gives himself for others' sake and that that spirit will then come to fill uh, both his ministers and the churches that listen to them but a church that is conversely organized around things that are not the institution of Christ will inevitably organize themselves around power because that is what is familiar to fallen men, as you were saying, Willie. He understands the gospel and the sacraments not to be simply, okay, these are the access points for God's grace. They're also the axis around which he thinks the whole church should be spinning. Yeah, and that's not to say that we that that they're that they're repudiating authority by no means, but we're talking about the lawful and biblical and wholesome exercise thereof. Right. Well, Christ himself exercises authority and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. So it's not the authority itself that is evil. Right. It's that abuse of it. We do talk about abuse and then we almost say it so much that I think it's lost its its ability. You know, we say don't abuse alcohol, and then you know we're we're slobbering drunks on the weekends, right? It's like we <laughs> that disconnect there. Like you really, you know, you literally should not abuse it. You really shouldn't be abusing this because it is destructive. You know, a drunk, let's say a single man who's a drunk, abuses his body and harms only himself and his own soul. But the one who has inferiors under him harms not only himself through his abuse but harms those beneath him. So a drunk with a family harms his wife and his children. So a man who's drunk on ambition and power can often harm those who work underneath him, whom God has given him to serve as master. And I'm just kind of small catechism posting right now. I realize that, that Lutheran (laughs) tendency, but, but that, that is the case. Masters have duty to those under them. Fathers have duties toward their family, even though they are in authority. Yeah, and just because something is simple, because it's in the small catechism, doesn't mean that it's that it's lacking in profundity. I think that something something about Henkel is that his points in the Carolinian and Herald are not hard to grasp, but they are very powerful insights, both about the history that came before him and about the things that will come after him. I mean, he observes, for instance, the tendency of the clergy to align themselves with power in many times and and many nations. And he observes that tendency as particularly injurious and tempting to a man of God who does not wield the sword, but who does believe that his claims should hold sway over all men. And so that man of God wants to take the shortcut and use the sword rather than the gospel to enforce those claims. So Henkel has a very powerful, a simple but powerful critique of a lot of history, in addition to his insights just about you know how church should be organized. All right, good stuff, guys. Um, 
We're right at time. Any last words on this before we wrap it up? If you are interested to go looking for this stuff on the internet or to find the collected works, which are published by Lutheran Legacy, you can you can get that online as well. And when you do that, you're going to find a lot more there. We're going to do at least one more episode on David Henkel, his confrontation with Methodism, which is really the burgeoning going concern in his time and place. Yeah. And with that, you know, remember to kind of connect all the dots here, go back to the other historical episodes we have, particularly anything dealing with American religious history, Second Great Awakening, the Tennessee Senate introduction, because we're we take the long way around. But all of these historic uh, podcasts are pieces of a broader puzzle. So if you got time and want to take a look at the old episodes, we suggest you go back and do that. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Adam. Always a pleasure. This has been A Word Fitly Spoken. If you want to know more, want to see the old episodes, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills here with Zelwyn Heidi and Adam Kuntz. God love you and God bless. Americans, I cannot conclude without alarming you a little more that our liberty is endangered. Behold how many dupes there are, duped by the worldly minded into their secular designs. What numbers have become so lukewarm in their political as well as religious principles that it becomes a matter of indifference for whom they vote as our representatives on the days of our election? This is the idle song of many. It matters not what manner of politics one is imbibed, whether of this or that, if he only means it well, if he can please us with his smiles, his neighborly turns shortly before the day of election, and or even with a bowl of grog, he shall have our suffrage. Oh, what a shame for free-born Americans to be like Esau, to sell their birthright for a trifle to despise so invaluable a legacy of God, our liberty, costing the blood of many of our forefathers. But it seems that liberty can only be enjoyed by a wise and virtuous people, but dupes and asses cannot live without tyrannical masters. I add no more, lest I should appear too political for a man in my office. However, I claim no more than citizenship and the freedom of speech. The humble servant of the reader, David Henkel.